We're also going to take a look at the different aspects of grief, uh, kind of what makes up that process, all those different pieces, but also take a look at the type of impact that it has on people's lives. And then here at Mental Health America of Hawaii, if you don't already know, we're very passionate about self-care. So we're also going to be working that in um, throughout the presentation because of the nature of the topic. Um, and we'll also be identifying other ways that we can practice self-care if we are moving through that grief process or that we can encourage other people to engage with those kind of healing tips that are more specifically related to grief. And then we're going to touch upon how to find some support and how to be that good kind of support for someone um, who is healing and maybe take a look at, again, some of those community resources that are available. Because our topic um, can be a little bit of an intense one at times, uh, we really encourage you all to practice some of that self-care and self-awareness, you know, listen, participate as you feel comfortable in doing so, take breaks as needed, practice self-care if you feel like that's needed as well. I think this can be a topic that has a little bit of stigma just due to how, you know, personal or private it can feel when talking about grief, right, and talking about loss. And it's one that, because of that, is not often discussed. So especially if you are joining us today uh, and you're actively going through that grieving or that healing process yourself, um, like myself, right? I am, it's been a journey. I, I'm still kind of in and out of it at different points and it's definitely a process. Sometimes it can feel a, a little overwhelming to, to hear um, information surrounding it. So I think it'll be helpful for us to start off Right, with some relaxation. So I'm going to give us all an opportunity to kind of ground ourselves before we jump into the material um, with some breathing exercises and watching one of our four minute meditation videos. So typically, um, if you haven't done uh, breathing exercises before, when we talk about <clears throat> taking deep breaths, we jump to like the upper chest area, right? That's kind of what we gravitate towards. But for today, we really want to focus on our diaphragm, which is more towards the top of our stomach. So an easy way to kind of tell this difference is to take one hand, put it on your chest. You take your second hand, put it on the top of your stomach, just above the belly button. You know, I'm a little off camera. I'm also pretty short. Um, if you could just have your pinky finger just above your belly button there, that's going to help you kind of tell the difference, right, of where you're pulling those breaths from. And now as we are breathing in, right, and taking those deep diaphragmatic breaths, what we want to focus on is having the hand that's on our stomach move a little bit more, push out a little bit further than the hand that's on our chest. Yeah, so just kind of being aware of pulling from that diaphragm area instead of the upper chest area. So um, why don't we practice this all together? I'll kind of walk you through it the first couple of times, and then we'll start the four minute meditation video, and then we can all take that moment to ground and center ourselves all together. So if you can find that comfortable seated or standing position, if you got that standing desk, okay? if it helps you to put your hand on your shoulder or a hand on your chest and hand on your stomach, please feel free to go ahead and do that. But we want to start by relaxing our shoulders. Okay? We want to kind of shift them downwards away from our ears. Now without straining, or pushing too much, we want to breathe in through our nose until we find ourselves not being able to take in air anymore, but that it's not uncomfortable, right? You just have that natural kind of barrier of this is my deep breath, right? Through the nose. So as we feel that air kind of moving through our nostrils and into our abdomen, we may notice that our stomachs are expanding, the sides of our waist are expanding as well, but our chests should still remain relatively still. We may notice movement, right? Of course, that hand on our chest may be moving up just a little bit, and that's okay. Really try to focus on the hand that's on your stomach and have that move just a little bit more. Now, as you're breathing in, you may find yourself um, exhaling out again through your nose or through your mouth. Either way is totally fine. But I want you to try exhaling through your mouth on your next breath. So we're taking that slow, deep breath in. And then purse your lips as if you're sipping through a straw and exhale slowly. So okay, a helpful kind of count to do that is typically four seconds. So if you can breathe in for four seconds, 
try to hold it for about four seconds and then exhaling out for four seconds. It's a good if you need kind of a little bit more pacing with that, but we're just going to be repeating the step several times all throughout the meditation video um, to get the best results possible. Yeah, <clears throat> so awesome. I know you're all off, ca off camera, but I have full faith and confidence that you're participating in those breathing exercises with me. Um, so let's go ahead and start that video and ground ourselves all together here. All right, thank you so much everyone for participating alongside with me. I hope you feel a little bit more relaxed and grounded. I know I definitely do. Um, 
You can find links to those uh, four minute meditation videos on our YouTube channel, which I'm pretty sure is somewhere um, within the slide deck. There's a bunch of different ones that we were able to kind of create. Uh, the night one I really enjoy. I also like the jellyfish and like the ice one. But like I said, a bunch of different ones that are out there. Uh, I wanted to start off too as well um, and end today's session with that, those relaxation exercises. Because again, we know that topic of grief and healing can sometimes be challenging for some folks. Um, another thing that we do here at Mental Health America of Hawaii is to share a quote alongside with our presentation. So this one is from Washington Irving. It says, there's a sacredness in tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are the messengers of overwhelming grief, of deep contrition, and of unspeakable love. And I think this is a really appropriate quote uh, for some of the things that we're gonna be discussing here today. So a little bit <clears throat> uh, statistics on grief. Again, we won't dive too deep into these, but it is helpful for us to have an idea of what our communities um, have been experiencing or are currently experiencing. So about 2.5 million people in the country, the United States each year um, pass, which in turn leaves an average of five people around each one of those 2.5 million um, in active grief, right? So when someone passes on average, there is about five people surrounding that person in their life. Um, who enter into that grieving, active grieving process. And additionally, about 1.5 million children who have lost a parent. Um, one survey found that 57% of respondents were actively grieving when they were completing the survey. And another survey found that 60% of folks believe grief is a private matter. About 45% found talking about death to be uncomfortable. And 63% avoided talking to someone about their loss, right? So reaching out uh, to the people in their in their support systems and even just having conversations about it. So with so many people being impacted and so few or so little getting actual support, you can see why it's important that we are having these conversations, right? Even if they may be difficult or uncomfortable at times, it's still important that we try to have them. So when we think about grief, um, typically we associate it with the loss of someone, right? With the death of a friend or family member or loved one. But grief re really can be the loss of something in general, right? At its core, grief is loss. That something could be loss of <clears throat> expectation, okay? For how maybe you thought something would turn out. It could be the loss of a relationship. It could be a loss of the family home, right? It could be so many different things that are cherished and loved by you. So loss is really in the eye of the beholder. You know, that's not always just necessarily the loss of um, a family member or loved one. So it's important to remember that people <clears throat> are grieving different types of things. Yeah. And grief can also look very differently if someone has a pre-existing history of trauma or experiencing uh, repeated griefs, right, throughout their past. And when someone goes into the active grieving process, some of the things that we have to look at is how much self-care, right, has that person been doing in addition to how many coping skills do they have that they're able to utilize in order to address some of those difficult feelings that come up during that grieving process. We also know that people grieve differently <clears throat> and they cope differently. So what may work for one person may not be as helpful or it may look entirely different for someone else. And that sometimes can create different challenges. Yeah. So for example, let's say there was a loss within a family system. <clears throat> you may have one family member who wants and needs to talk about what's happening, right? Because they're in a place where they feel like they're able to do that right now. While another family member who might be really close to that individual may not be able to do that just yet, right? They're not in that same space or that same place of being able to talk about it, or they're not moving at the same pace as that person who experienced that loss. Okay? Um, so just an example of a challenge that could arise. I think it's also important to note that just because two people may have gone through similar losses, uh, it doesn't mean that they have the same experience or that they go through the same process, right? Now, with that being said, it can also be validating, okay, for some 
to connect to another person who has gone through a similar loss or similar experience. We may not have had the exact same experience, but I have an understanding of what it's like to lose someone in generally a similar way. Yeah. And so it really just depends person to person and experience to experience. What we want to do is emphasize the importance of honoring the process itself. Yeah. People can be in different places and using different types of coping skills, and that's okay as long as they are safe, appropriate, and healthy. Okay, so uh, different causes of grief, there are all also different reasons behind why someone may experience grief in general, as we just mentioned, right, and saw on the previous slide. But some additional ones could include losses um, due to suicide, divorce, maybe losses due to chronic or terminal illness, loss of a pet, loss of a job, etc. And remember, again, loss is in the eye of the beholder, but more examples, the loss of a loved one could be um, again, some of these other things that we see on the slide there. The loss of a pet could absolutely have a very large impact on someone, loss of cherished items, etc. So like you heard in the beginning, uh, my background's in public health. So if you know anything about public health, you know we love our models, we love our theories, right? We want to be able to try to explain human behavior so that we can, you know, develop interventions, implement them, right, and better the community overall. Um, so these are, uh, we're going to highlight just a couple different ones um, over the next few slides. Um, and, you know, there's different types of ones that are out there, but one of the ones that is most often brought up and discussed surrounding grief is the Kubler-Ross model. So again, disclaimer, um, not a mental health professional by any way, in any means. And I'm not saying that this is necessarily like a, you know, thoroughly evidence-based model and that these are the steps that someone takes, right, when they are grieving. This model itself may not fit exactly what someone goes through, um, but it can be used as a loose framework. And that's what I want you to kind of take away from this, is this is, you know, how we can begin a conversation on what grief may or may not look like for different people. So to kind of quickly go through the different stages <clears throat> of the model, we might see some denial right? Some denying of the reality of the situation. It's not here. It's not me. It's not anyone that I know, or maybe someone even experiencing that kind of shock, right? Um, we might also see and experience anger or anxiety, you know, feeling not in control over a situation can feel overwhelming, which could then lead to feelings of anxiety, anger, and irritability. Now, for some, expressing anger might be easier to do than expressing something like sadness. But we really want to make sure we're looking at both of those emotions as just being two sides of the same point, right? It's still coming from the same place. And we also want to remember that we can't control everything. Uh, so it's important to focus on what we do have control over, like our own responses, right? What are we choosing to utilize as far as coping mechanisms, which we'll be talking about all the different ways we can do that over the course of the slides here. There may also be some bargaining that's happening too, right? You may um, be saying or hear people saying, you know, like, if I do this, then can this happen? Yeah. Or if only I had done this, then maybe things would have turned out a little bit differently. And what we want to try to do is transform that into sharing stories about that person <clears throat> and being more supportive around the good parts of their life, right? And how they lived. It's also normal to feel an increase of sadness and grief, but if you find it starting to really have an impact on your life in a significant way, like your ability to get through your day and carry out those daily activities, connect with the people that you have in your life, it's starting to affect friendships and relationships with the people around you, it's starting, your effect, it's starting to affect your ability to work, to learn, to function, yeah? Then that's the time to think about maybe reaching out for some extra help and support we hope that people will eventually be able to move into a place of acceptance. Yeah. So for radical acceptance specifically, we're not saying that it's okay that that painful thing happened, but rather that I'm putting my energy into healing from it, right? Then, you know, putting my energy into maybe denying that it happens, for example, or ruminating over it. 
<clears throat> and again, everyone is different. Some people may not go through each of these stages, right? Or maybe they won't go through them in a linear fashion, right? It would be like, okay, I'm, I'm done with denial. Now I'm going to move into anger, anxiety. I'm done with that. I'm going to bargaining, right? So on and so forth. For some, they may be in denial and then they move into acceptance and then go right back into denial. denial. For others, um, they may move from denial to experiencing some depression or increased sadness and then maybe into anger and anxiety. And so for you, remember, it's just important to honor the process itself, right? Whatever that process may be. Another type of grief model is the course of grief, which is a little bit more broad uh, than the Kubler-Ross model. This one talks about the course of grief, right? Hence the name. So what does grief kind of look like when we take that step back, right? When we have that broader perspective. So one of the things that they highlight in this model is the sense of numbness or almost like unrealness that can happen in the very beginning, but sometimes throughout too, right? Throughout that process, you may move in and out of feelings of that numbness, but that's something that they highlight. Another part that they highlight is the pining, yeah? You may find yourself pining for something or wishing for something or someone that you lost to be back in your life, which can absolutely be challenging. And because of these challenging feelings, you may become disorganized, right? In regards to our emotions, right? We may find them just kind of being all over the place. Um, maybe we encounter some disorganization in our life in general. Like maybe it's hard to just get through our day or even just get the basic things and tasks done. And then at some point, <clears throat> you start to reorganize, right? You start to be able to get back into your day to day and be able to move through it and be able to cope. Now, please note that it doesn't say that you will reorganize back to the way that you were or the way that things were before, yeah? Before that loss happens. Some losses are so profound that it changes you, right? Like it just inherently changes you and it reorganizes you <clears throat> Sometimes it even reorganizes your values where you start to prioritize things that maybe didn't seem as important as before. So just something to know about that reorganization. It's not going back to the person you were or the things that thing or the way that things were before that event happened. So as with the previous model, again, the emphasis is on finding or even providing support to heal that reorganization process, right? We wanna help people get to that point because uh, that can look differently for everyone. And we're gonna be going through the different strategies that we can utilize to what maybe we wanna look for when we're in that grieving process or for trying to help someone who's within that grieving process. Like what are some strategies we can utilize ourselves? Sometimes we think about crying <clears throat> um, as a thing that needs to happen. But as we've just learned, everyone grieves differently. This may not happen for everyone or during the entire process. It may not even happen every single time that someone goes through the grief process because sometimes that's something that happens multiple times, right? Or at multiple points throughout a lifespan. Um, just because someone doesn't cry doesn't mean that they're unaffected or they're not actively in the grieving process, okay? If crying does not happen in the natural process of healing, then that's okay. Crying versus not crying isn't an indication of like healthy versus unhealthy or healthier. It's just where that person is, right? That's just where they are. If you feel like you need to cry, but you find yourself pushing away the tears, pushing away the crying, right? Kind of sucking it in and, and blocking yourself from it, then that's different. Yeah. You may want to reflect on why you're doing that. Right? Why you find yourself responding in that way to the tears that may be coming up. And it may even be a good opportunity to look for that additional support or connecting to a professional who can help you process all of that. <clears throat> there are physical symptoms right, that um, sometimes we experience or other people may experience when they're going through their healing process and they're grieving. Yeah, so these are just a few that can happen, but generally um, we hear experiences surrounding fatigue. So just being very tired, needing more naps than usual, just feeling kind of run down. Um, for some, maybe they have a loss of appetite, right? They're just not feeling hungry, maybe not 
you know, like eating regularly, skipping meals. Other people may experience things like headaches, body aches, or soreness, right? We kind of hold that stress, we hold that grief within our bodies to where it starts to affect that. Um, there can also be stomach pains or gastrointestinal issues, which we often see when stress and anxiety are present. There can also be heart palpitations, okay? And many, many other <clears throat> physical symptoms that someone could potentially experience during that grieving process. So if you are actively in a grieving process or you know someone who is, and they're experiencing a lot of these kind of physical symptoms, it might be a good idea to check in with your or their doctor just to make sure everything is okay on the medical side of things. We know that stress can have a pretty significant negative impact on the body. So we just want to make sure um, that we're checking in with our medical professionals to rule out any other kind of medical complications that might arise. We can also look <clears throat> more specifically at our mental health as we move through the healing process while we're grieving, yeah? So we often expect kind of to see things like sadness or maybe even someone experiencing depression or various symptoms of depression. Sleep is also a really big one and I'm gonna highlight sleep a little more thoroughly in just a little bit here, but we know that anxiety and depression and grief are closely related to sleep issues and it can be really difficult to heal when you're not getting quality sleep or enough sleep. Uh, we talked about anger anxiety, right? And for some people who may be in a deep process um, that may sometimes turn into suicidal thoughts and we'll also identify different kinds of resources for those just a bit later, but know what those crisis resources are just in case you or someone else may be having thoughts of suicide. How can you access those and, and access that support? Um, this slide says COVID-19, but in reality, um, these are things that we kind of, you know, see happening for any kind of, um, you know, like mass trauma, right, or community events. And it also takes a while to conduct research and make it available to the public. So experts are still observing and analyzing the impacts from the Maui wildfires, right, last year, because those are still occurring. Those are still happening. It's not just the responses that we saw immediately after the event, we're going to continue seeing those responses in different ways in different stages um, for years to come. Yeah, so we're still kind of keeping our eye on it, but generally things that we sometimes see right in that process um, are things like separation distress, right? So some people, um, you know, specifically with COVID-19 experience distress over being separated because we saw and we experienced that physical kind of separateness, right? Where we had to distance ourselves because of safety um, and making sure ourselves and other people are safe. And so that in turn made people feel less connected to their social support systems, even while they were going through that grieving process, right? There was that kind of separation. Uh, we also saw an element of dysfunctional grief which I don't want you to think of um, as being a negative or stigmatizing word, because I think sometimes our minds jump to that, right, when we hear dysfunctional. Um, so it might even be helpful for us to view this as interrupted grief, yeah. Um, so when that grieving process, you know, there's a, you're not following along with that predictable course, right, or that quote-unquote typical grieving response, right, um, into the healing. So when the process deviates from the norm or it's interrupted, then that individual becomes overwhelmed and sometimes they resort to maladaptive or unhealthy coping strategies as a way to kind of manage that. For some people, we also see experiences of post-traumatic stress disorder, right, because of how that loss occurred, because of the events that happened. So just some things to kind of keep in mind um, of different types of responses that people generally have uh, to grief. So as we move through the healing process, it can be difficult to find the energy to do anything at all. So we want to be really selective when we do have the energy and how you're going to spend that time. Okay. So sometimes we may even find the things that we did um, as self-care before we entered into the healing process may not be as effective once we're in it. Right? The things that we used to do before just aren't having that same level of making myself feel better. Okay? 
Uh, and some of these may work for you, while others, uh, they may not find them very effective, and that's perfectly okay. We just want you to have options. And so we're going to go through and provide kind of this bigger list, and I have another slide on it as well, um, so that you have different opportunities and different activities to try to see which ones are going to be most effective for you, even when you're in different places. All right, so sleep. Again, we're going to talk about sleep in just a moment here, but getting outside, okay, spending time in nature, getting some sun can help someone reset, right? Unplug from technology, even if it's just for 10 minutes or even half an hour. I know we're very connected to all of our devices. It's a part of our everyday throughout the day kind of thing, but it can help to provide some distance when you unplug and take a step back or even take a break and give you an opportunity to re-energize. Mastered skills can also help. So things like playing an instrument, right? Um, things that you have already mastered is the key there that you're not learning or teaching yourself things. <clears throat> but mastered skills can absolutely be helpful to lean on during the healing process because it's something that you've already mastered. You've got it down and you enjoy it. Yeah. Aromatherapy, for those who like it, can be really effective as well. Uh, just make sure you're doing your homework if you're not super familiar with it or you haven't <clears throat> entered into that, that practice. Um, you know, there are some just examples, right? Like essential oils that could be unsafe uh, to when they're diffused. Some should only be used when they're diffused. Others will be unsafe around children and pets. So, you know, just kind of keep in mind if aromatherapy is something that you'd like to try, just do a little bit of research. <clears throat> or even talk to someone who um, has some experience utilizing aromatherapy. We can also try to set up a cozy, comfortable space. Okay? What we're doing is creating a space for us to feel comfortable when grief can sometimes make us feel uncomfortable. So that favorite blanket, listening to relaxing music or sounds, warm cup of tea can generally help us feel better. So we can create that right in our environment. Uh, taking care of something else can also help, okay? Which some of you may be thinking like, I don't even have the energy to take care of myself. So how do I expect myself to take care of something else? Yeah. However, what we do know from research is that taking care of something else allows for <clears throat> bringing back some control, right, into someone's life. Even when everything seems out of control, everything seems kind of all over the place, at least in this space or with this one thing that I'm taking care of, there's still enrichment, there's still growth, and that life is continuing forward. So go out and get that succulent. And I say succulent because that's about the extent of my, my plant skills, okay? But go out and get that plant, right? Something to take care of and for you to see that there's still that enrichment growth and continuation of life. <clears throat> and don't forget about the basics. Right? Nourishing meals, physical activity are also proven to be effective. If you enjoy things like journaling, <clears throat> it can be helpful to put those emotions onto a page. Yeah, so you're not like <clears throat> keeping them bottled up, right? Um, that you're expressing them, you're getting them out in some way. And if you're not able to get out into nature, even taking like five or 10 minutes to do like a visualization exercise can help you visually, right? And use your imagination to take that walk through nature or to get to the beach and listen to the waves crashing and feel the breeze you know, um, without physically having to leave that space. And there's a lot of really awesome guided visualization exercises that are out there. I'm pretty sure we have a recording of one on our YouTube channel if you'd like to check that out. Uh, there's also guided scripts that are out there if you want to help other people uh, kind of walk through those visualization exercises, but can also be an effective strategy. And when you're ready to, you want to find that person who's a great listener, right? Who you can share those feelings and those experiences with. And we will talk about what that entails, right? With being good listeners for someone who may be grieving, but we want to find that person to be able to connect with. Um, some other tips, right? We want to be careful about um, isolating ourselves. In reality, people do need time alone sometimes to figure it out, right? I need to figure out what I need when I feel overwhelmed. Sometimes I just need time to figure out what I need in general to help me through this process. But we just want to make sure 
that we're avoiding that isolation, that we are still reaching out and connecting to our support systems. If you are a part of a faith or organized religious system, this can also be a really great place to find that support. Part of the healing process is to make sense or meaning out of the experience. Now, I don't just mean like justifying or trying to find like positive reasoning as to why something has happened or why that loss occurred. It could even be acknowledging that sometimes these things do happen, right? Sometimes this is a part of life and unfortunately it happened to me or it happened to someone that I love and care about. But how am I going to make sense of moving forward and healing through it? And, you know, uh, finding spiritual support, whether that's within an organized religion or outside of one, can help you walk along that path or walk along that journey. And going for a walk, actually physically getting out going for a walk um, is also effective. Yeah. But I want to acknowledge it. Sometimes that's difficult, especially when you have low energy, but it really does help. Okay. This was um, a really incredibly helpful for one for me when I was in that deep kind of beginning stages of my grief process where it was hard for me to like get out of bed and do things right and just kind of function on a daily basis get dressed let alone go outside right and physical activity all of that like what um but I was able to do it right not every day you know not super consistently in the beginning but over time I felt better you know, and over time, I found myself almost looking forward to being able to get out and to go for a walk and just kind of be mindful or, you know, listen to nature or um, listen to a podcast, whatever that may be. Um, so it can help, right? And it may not help for every single person. But on a personal note, this was one that really helped for me. You can even make it like a friend or group activity. So Dr. Goss, um, my coworker who actually created this presentation, um, talks about muddy buddies right? as the way like she would go out with her friends to hike and just like get in nature and dirt and mud. When I hear the word mud, I turn around and walk the opposite direction, right? So just make sure, you know, if you are connecting with people to help you kind of get out and do these activities with, it could help provide motivation, um, but just make sure that people are understanding that process, right? That if you're making plans that they're going to understand that sometimes those plans aren't going to happen that day. Right. And they're going to be like, OK, right. I look forward to the next time. Or how can I help support you? Um, it's also normal to struggle uh, when you go through the grief process. But when you feel like you're really struggling, where you're concerned about how long this has been going on for, how deep it's gotten or how difficult it is to kind of pull yourself up right out of that grief, even just to get those daily activities done. And uh, that's when we want to learn really specific coping skills that could be helpful. Um, so these could th be things like meditation. It doesn't have to be a full on guided one hour long meditation. It could be something really brief, right? Like just a couple minutes. Um, it could also be something like mindfulness, right? Being present focused. So I'm only going to focus on the next five minutes in front of me. And that's it. And when that's over, I'm going to focus on the next five minutes, right? And kind of being mindful and present focused and also practicing that radical acceptance, which you talked about just a little bit ago. If you're not in a grieving process, um, learning more about grief literacy so that you can help support someone that you care about and or your community in general is effective self-care, right? Every single one of us at some point in our lives will go through some type of grief process, so if you have been privileged enough to not have to go through that yet, uh, we recommend you learning a little bit more so that you can effectively support others, which is exactly what you were all doing by attending today, right? You're learning more and increasing that grief literacy. Um, sleep. <clears throat> sleep is so restorative and it's so healing, yet it's often one of the first things that is impacted during the grief process. So we want to make sure that we have a sleep schedule and that we stick to that schedule. Okay? It helps to create rituals surrounding it, right? Surrounding sleep, which typically we start or happen um, within 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime is when you're going through your wind down routine. So for example, putting our phone down, putting it away, charging it, right? Turning down the lights, brushing our teeth, washing our face, 
putting our, our pajamas, et cetera. Um, try to think of the things you did when you were little <laughs> to wind down and to get ready for bed. And the more routine we have surrounding sleep, our brain will start to pick those things up. Yeah, it'll start to pick up on those rituals and put you into a more relaxed state. So that might be easier for you to actually fall asleep. Having optimum environmental controls can also help, right? So maybe it's not just turning down the lights, but turning off the lights, uh, depending on your comfort, comfort level, uh, creating a comfortable space to sleep, maybe having calming scents or soothing sounds um, that are happening in the background. Cooler temperatures help to lower body temperature, which actually naturally happens when people are going to sleep. So we live in Hawaii, it's generally pretty warm, okay? So we may have to lower the environmental temperature because that process may not be happening naturally for us, right, as we move into sleep. So if we can cool it down a little bit, turn on that AC for a little bit, if you can turn up that fan, um, that might help start that process. Try to be electronics free, uh, but if you are someone who likes to have that TV playing in the background, just make sure it's a show you've seen multiple times, yeah, so you're not staying awake trying to pay attention. Um, and maybe there's even a timer involved with it, so it turns off eventually. Naps, okay, if you're a napper, you know how beautiful they can be. Um, we gotta be smart about those two. We wanna try to do it generally, you know, before 2 p.m. Um, and try to keep it on the same rhythm as the waves that you go through when you're asleep. So like 30, 60, 90, right, as you go through those cycles. If you can keep it within those ranges, then you'll have more effective naps. Um, if you're one of those people who your thoughts are just kind of like going, 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 you have a lot of thoughts or you find yourself going through like what I need to do the next day, like, OK, I got to do this, 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 I got to get that. Um, you can you might find it hard to shut that down right, to be able to go to sleep. So try dumping it. Right, Keep a journal, keep a notepad next to your bed where you can write all those things down. Take a couple minutes, five to 10 minutes before you go to sleep. That way, you know, it's there. You can look at it in the morning. But remember, the point is to dump it. Right? You're not brainstorming a brand new project or things that you need to go through thoroughly a, a process um, for the next day, but you're getting it out. You know, take a look at it tomorrow. Um, when we talk about grief, especially um, when it's specifically surrounding losing someone, we may find it difficult during certain days. We call those kind of memorable days or memorable moments. And this is because especially during you know that first year usually, it's the first time that you're experiencing those special days without that person there. So things like birthdays, holidays, anniversaries. And so it's important to know for yourself what those days are going to be and to plan ahead. So identify what could potentially be, um, you know, triggers for you on that day. And I'm trying to find another word to use instead of triggers just because of the gun culture that we have here in the United States, but I won't get on my soapbox about that. Um, you know, find what may be activating for you, what may, you know, be something that, you know, an indication to yourself, like, I'm still working on this, and I need to plan ahead um, as much as possible, yeah, and so add in relaxation and self-care, reach out, connect to those in your support systems who are really awesome at actually being good supports for you, and just give them a heads up when those challenging days or moments may be coming up. Um, this can be an opportunity for someone in your life to learn how to support you, kind of know what you need, like what do you need? Do you need alone time? Do you need to spend time with someone? How can I help you through your grief? Uh, but it's also an opportunity for us to learn about us, right? And identifying how do we support ourselves or what exactly is it that we might need? Another thing to remember, too, is that uh, some of these memorable days have specific rituals surrounding them. These could be things like maybe a favorite meal uh, that was always prepared and eaten on that day, or maybe an activity that you always did on that day. And so it's important to remind ourselves that you can continue to do those rituals as they are in memory or in honor of someone. And it's also okay to create new rituals as well. Okay, right? so... Um, sometimes we may ask, like, oh, how do I do that? Like, what does that look like? How do I honor a life when I am grieving? And the answer is, there's no one right answer. It's very individualized. It looks different for everyone. For some, they may get a sentimental item, like a piece of journal, jewelry, uh, to represent the relationship in like a physical way, right? So they're able to see it, you're able to kind of touch it. 
even wear it. So it almost becomes like a daily ritual for someone to honor and reflect. For others, that might be too much or too soon. It's just not in their comfort level to be able to do that. And that's also okay. Other people may decide uh, to support a cause or contribute a donation to something that that person was passionate about, or maybe it was something that they were trying to heal from themselves. So then you make that donation or contribution. Um, some do like living reminders. So maybe uh, planting a garden or planting a tree, right? And having those living memorials. Some may just start a new tra tradition altogether. Yeah, maybe that's gathering together, uh, making a new meal or going on a hike, but being in community and remembering and honoring that person. It's also possible to create space within favorite traditions, right, and favorite rituals. So things that you were already doing, you can create space within those to honor someone who you lost. Yeah, so maybe it's just taking a moment of silence okay, before you eat. Maybe it's um, still setting that place at the table or leaving that chair that the person always sat on, right? Kind of empty, but, you know, you're creating that space within those experiences and within those rituals. Um, sharing stories can also be a way to honor someone. Sharing stories about their life and focusing on that, right? Their life and how they lived their life can also be an important part of the process. And you can also engage in that person person's favorite activities together with loved ones, right? Maybe it's fishing, maybe it's playing some bingo, right? Maybe things that you don't um, yourself actively engage in, but that person that you're trying to honor really loved. And remember, this is just a list of a few examples okay, of how some people have been known to honor a life. Um, in the healing process, okay, so I want to be transparent in saying that the healing process can sometimes be a lifelong process, okay? The idea is that you loved someone and you're always going to love them. So it makes sense that you're always going to be healing through those transitions, right? And kind of through that journey, however you make meaning of it, that's something that you may hold with you for the rest of your life. And again, this looks differently for everyone. So knowing how that is going to progress, how that might change throughout the lifespan and how you're going to make meaning of it is important, right? that contributes towards healing. Grief has a way of making you, I think you're gonna take a deep look within yourself and sometimes even like rearranging your priorities, right? Or even your values. But what we do know is that as you change and as you transform yourself, that in and of itself is a natural process, okay? How, you know, you know, life, but also passing is a part of that natural process as we move through it, as painful as it can be to move through that, that we do gain some things from, you know, maybe it's an appreciation of life, which can be motivating sometimes to say, I'm going to live my life every single day to its fullest as much as possible, because I know that it's so precious. Some may also get an increase of empathy for others, especially for those maybe who have gone through a similar loss as yourself, where you say, you know, I had no idea what that was like until it happened to me or until I started moving through that. Um, if you come from a faith base, it may help you kind of re-engage or even increase engagement with it because you're saying my faith is helping me to make meaning out of this loss that I've experienced. It may also give people a sense of purpose, right, or meaning where they become advocates for things like suicide prevention or cancer awareness. And remember, this could happen at vastly different time frames from person to person. Some people may be ready to do this, right, find that purpose and meaning and engage with it um, at year one. Other people may not be ready until year 10. It's a process and it's an individualized process. It can also help you connect with your support systems because when there's a loss, you really start to notice who shows up, who's able to come and support you in a way that actually feels supportive to where you appreciate that on a different level and you appreciate that person on a deeper level too. And it clarifies again, who and what is in your support system? What does that look like? If there were parts of that process that didn't feel as supportive um, or weren't as strong as maybe you needed them to be, that's where you acknowledge that, right? Acknowledge it and add in things to continue building in that support. Like maybe talking to a mental health professional who specializes um, or has experience with grief work. So I know I've talked a lot 
um, about the importance of a support system. But how does that work? Yeah, we want the support system to be just that, supportive. It's important for us to remember that not everyone has attended this webinar, right? Or has great grief literacy. And even if we did have great grief literacy, we may not say the right words or do the right things or be that awesome support because we're human beings. And that's something we have to radically accept because there's so much stigma and uncomfortableness yeah, surrounding death and grief that not everyone is able to learn those skills, not everyone is able to utilize those skills. And that's okay, right? That's something that we just have to acknowledge. So what we want to look for um, in seeking support from someone, we're looking for someone who provides support and listens, who's judgment-free, who is someone that we're able to talk to about our experiences without them trying to fix it. Okay, because there's some things in life that are unfixable and unchangeable. And sometimes you just need to talk it out. We want to look for someone who maybe is sometimes able to offer advice, but only when it's asked for. And someone who knows that too, in and of itself, right? I don't need you to fix it. I need you to hear me. If I need something, then I'll ask for it. I just need a little bit of time to kind of figure out what that thing is. And we want to have our experiences validated, not minimized. So saying things like, that was pretty bad, but it could have been worse if this happens, or at least it wasn't this, okay? So I think the attention of these phrases um, comes from the desire of wanting people to be okay, despite the things that have happened to them, but it doesn't always come across that way, okay? And it's okay if that's something that you've done or said before, I've definitely said dead. <laughs> definitely done and said those things before, right? Um, but now that we know how unsupportive that can feel to someone who is grieving, then we can try to do better next time, right? Well, we know better than we do better, hopefully at least, yeah. Um, so if you have gone through a similar process or if you've had a similar process, again, um, you know, validating, um, you know, offering that connection to another person who's had similar experiences um, can be helpful. Yeah, they may be able to be a little bit more intentional in how they communicate with you, whereas some people who maybe haven't gone through similar experiences um, or gone through something like that, they may be trying to be helpful with the things that they're doing or they're saying, or it's just, it doesn't feel supportive. Okay. Um, if you are not in an active healing process, but you know someone or love someone and care about someone who is, there are some ways to also provide that support. So it's not just us, like, what is it that we want to seek out? How do we help provide that? <clears throat> so um, we want to improve our mental health and grief literacy. So again, thank you for being here today and wanting to learn more. It can be tempting as well to utilize uh, platitudes, but we want to try to stay away from using them. You know, something like, Time heals all wounds, okay? Even though these platitudes are almost expected because that's what's modeled for us, right? We see them on all of those sympathy cards when we go to the grocery store, we look for that section, section right? Where's that sympathy card? We see all of those platitudes there. In reality, um, they don't always come across as genuine. Um, sometimes they may even come across as like glossing over someone's experiences. What we prefer, and typically what people prefer in general, is honesty, okay? I don't know what to say, but I love you. I don't know what to do, but I care about you. And let me know if there's anything that I can do. Let me know how to support you. Um, we've already talked about those phrases, right? The at least phrases, or it could have been worst phrases. Uh, but we want people to have the power the confidentiality and the space to share about their loss. Okay, so be mindful that you know when we're hearing people's stories and hearing about their their journeys, that we're not going out and sharing that information um, because maybe they haven't given us permission to share that out, or maybe they haven't shared it out themselves. Right, so we have to kind of remind ourselves where what our place is. Right, and our goal is to be that listener and provide someone with the space to share. Um, when we feel uncomfortable, right, we sometimes avoid the things that make us feel uncomfortable. So uh, be careful about avoiding or ignoring the grieving person if you're not sure what to do, even just sitting with someone. 
right? And sharing space with someone and not talking, but being there can be enough. And then maybe we can try offering practical help, right? I love practical help. It's one that people don't always think about right away, um, but we also want to be careful about offering too many options. Yeah, here's a list of 15 things that I can offer support, right? What, what do you pick? What do you want? Um, that can feel overwhelming to someone, right, who is grieving. They may not have it in themselves to think about the things that they need. Um, or maybe they aren't able to prioritize on that level. So to make it simpler, make it simpler. I can bring you dinner on Wednesday or Friday this week, which looks better for you. Simple options. It That way, right, um, they can tell you whether or not that's what they want in the first place. Right now, we're okay, right? we got a bunch of people dropping off food, so we're good, right? For dinner for the next um, week or so. Um, or, you know, maybe that day isn't the best. Can we try like Tuesday or Thursday? Right? But you're giving that opportunity and you're keeping it simple. Um, practical help can also be something like, hey, I'm going to the store later. Can I pick up anything for you and drop it off? Yeah. Um, again, giving that listening ear, remembering that everyone grieves differently. If you have gone through that similar process or that similar loss, as I said before, it can be validating uh, to connect with someone or another person who's, you know, kind of gone through something similar. They may be a little more intentional, how they communicate, all those things. Um, but we want to make sure we're putting that focus on the other person, right? And not our own experiences. Yeah. Uh, be consistent in your support too, right? Check in with them and offer that support six months out, one year out, five years down the road, right? In appropriate ways. You don't want to be overwhelming to someone, but that's important, right? And I see people sharing um, some of their personal experiences in, in, in the chats. Um, and I, I thank you for that. You know, I thank you for acknowledging that, hey, I'm still in this healing process. I'm still grieving to this day. And it, oh, my loss was decades ago. And you want to continue honoring that. And you want to continue this journey because it is a journey. But um, hopefully you have some new ways or even reminders of how you can support yourself and or other people who are also continuing on in their journey as well. And being consistent about that helps. And it really does make a difference. Um, sometimes this topic can be so painful for adults to talk about that can be even more difficult for us to think about having conversations like this with little ones or with children. Um, so there are books that are out there that can be helpful when a child may be going through that grieving process themselves. You can even put one or a few of them um, in their little library so it introduces them to the topic of loss. And then you can build in those supports to help them through it as needed or if it's needed. So here's just some recommendations. Um, we have The Heart and the Bottle. This is for a little bit, I think, older older kids. This is about a little girl who loses her grandfather. So she decides to put her heart into a bottle and keep it safe as she grows up. It stays in the bottle. So that turns into her like distancing herself from people. And as she gets older, she meets uh, another child who needs support. And it kind of reminds her of what she used to be like. So it almost becomes safe for her to take her heart out of that bottle again. And then she becomes someone who lives her life as a memorial or in honor of her grandfather that she lost. Uh, the Rabbit That Listened is also a, a nice one uh, for a little bit younger ages, right? Uh, this is about a child who is building a structure of blocks, right? And it falls down and they're very upset about it, okay? And all these different animals come to try to make them laugh or to cheer them up or to get them to rebuild. And the rabbit just sits and listens because it turns out that's what that child needed. And when the child finishes telling the story, right, and talking about what happened, then they feel ready to laugh and to rebuild and to move forward. So it's just kind of a beautiful reminder uh, that sometimes listening is what people need first and foremost. Uh, the boy, the mole, the fox, and the horse. This one is not very plot driven, uh, but it's more of like a series of watercolors with sentimental sayings. On them. So one of the examples is um, the boy saying, you know, sometimes I feel lost. And then the mole says, me too, but we love you and love brings you home. So cute reminders to kind of reground, to recenter you in that healing process alongside some beautiful watercolor artwork. Uh, the Fall of Freddy the Leaf is also a great story uh, for people who are more kind of nature-based. Freddy the Leaf, you know, comes into his own awareness of being, essentially. And so there are times where he's out with his friends and then 
he begins to notice, right, when they fall. And so he enters into that grieving process and really takes the time to reflect on the meaning of everything. And then at some point he realizes that he will also be ready to fall from the tree. And so he kind of sees that full cycle of life, right, and the beauty of it itself. So just some examples of different types of books that are out there um that you can you know i think some of these are actually pretty helpful for adults right in their own grieving process and some of you may be thinking like oh like where are the recommendations for adults but we don't have a slide for it because people come from so many different backgrounds right um cultural backgrounds faith backgrounds whatever it may be so you know offering recommendations like that starts to become a little bit more complex right uh, to identify, but there's a lot of different types that are out there. You just may need to do a little bit of research, right? Hop on Google a little bit, find out the different types, and then find the right fit for you. But I think good starting points are actually children's books, yeah. Um, there's different resources that are out there as well. So the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, their whole eight chapter, they help to provide support um, surrounding a suicide loss. They do an awesome job. Um, organizing activities and community events like, um, you know, uh, like the Out of the Darkness Walk, right, which is held statewide every year. And they also help to organize the International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day, um, where family members and loved ones can come together to support each other. The Hawaii Psychological Association's bereavement recommendations also provides a lot of different options depending on what you know you or the person you're trying to help is looking for. So that's a great resource to check out. Um, there's also th things like Grief Share, Navi and Hawaii, and Children Grieve have, that also have their own kind of lists of different types of resources. And again, you'll get copies of all of these slides, um, so you'll be able to kind of copy and paste those links into your browsers. So I know. Um, it's a lot of information that I kind of sped through and I want to make sure I leave time at the end for questions and comments and things of that nature. But I said at the beginning of today that I wanted to start us off okay, with some relaxation and grounding. So I also want to take the opportunity to spend a few minutes taking those same deep diaphragmatic breaths that we learned and practiced earlier but watching butterflies, right? So another kind of quick little video. And the reason why we like the butterfly video is because it's a little more upbeat okay, um, than the night one that we saw earlier, but also some of us may be returning, right? Back to our work day. And this presentation especially may feel a little bit heavier just because of the nature of the topic. So we want to kind of do something to ground ourselves and maybe even lift up our moods and our energy levels a little bit so that we can continue on our Friday and then hopefully be able to enjoy our weekend that's coming up, yeah. Um, so go ahead and do your hand placements if you'd like, find that comfortable seated or standing position and then we'll, we'll watch this video together.
All right. I apologize. I saw in the. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry if the video is blinking and cutting in and out for you. Um, it is a more upbeat, upbeat video, so maybe not necessarily relaxing, but hopefully it did kind of wake you up a little bit so you can continue on um, with your workday or if you're in your time zone where your workday is, pal, and you're just here to, to learn a little bit more. Hopefully it helped you um, get a little excited uh, for your weekend. Um, like I said, all these videos are on our YouTube channel, so I'll make sure to share those links with you um, to uh, be able to go back and watch them if you found them kind of helpful. There's different types that are out there. Um, so here's, you know, just some of our, our social media handles. Um, here's our general kind of contact information as well. Um, for participants, right, I can interact with you via the chat, but I uh, cannot turn your camera on or, or unmute, but I can still see what you're dropping in the chat. Um, but that's pretty much all of the uh, kind of information wise I have for you today. I'd like to, you know, open up to any questions that folks might have. Um, I see things coming in the chat, so give me a moment and kind of scan through things there. Um, Amanda, I had a question. Great, yes, please. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, is time alone important in the grieving process, or do people see more benefits when they are spending time with friends and family during this process? That's a great question. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the time alone necessarily. Time itself is part of the grieving process in general. Um, so you can spend that time doing different things and you really wanna find things that are gonna be helpful for you in moving through that healing process. So sometimes it is spending time with friends and family and honoring and reflecting or creating new rituals and traditions. Um, sometimes it's spending some time alone to kind of reflect upon those things or to take some space to kind of ground yourself and and do all of that. Um, so it really just depends. Time in and of itself is a part of it, right? Time continues on even when we don't want it to sometimes, uh, but at least we can choose and find the things that are going to help us heal, right, during that grieving process too. And one of the comments I see is, yes, as introverts, we do need time alone to recharge, but just not too much. We just want to be uh, careful of isolating ourselves. Yeah. Thank you so much. I see another question in the chat. Um, any information on the grief recovery method? Do you know anything about that? Um, that I do not know too much about just off the top of my head, um, but I'm sure there are different kinds of resources out there that can help you explore that a little bit more. I see another question. How long is too long for grieving? That's a good question, right? All as well. Um, I'm not sure if there's a right answer for that one. Because, you know, I mentioned earlier in the presentation that sometimes that grieving is a lifelong process. You know, it's something that we hold within ourselves throughout the lifespan. So I wouldn't look at it as how much grieving is like too much grieving. Um, what I would look at is how much of an impact this is having on my day to day. Yeah. So is my grief and me trying to process and manage everything that comes alongside of it? Is it affecting my ability to get through my day? Is it affecting my ability to connect with people I care about? Is it affecting my ability to show up? right at work to learn new things to be effective to get things done so if you're starting to see those impacts in those different areas or settings then that would be that kind of cause of concern so that would be an indication like oh maybe i need to kind of reach out um and connect with someone uh who's a little bit more experienced in, in that grief work there yeah but that's a good question i don't think there's any specific timeline on it thank you for answering that one okay i see Another question, how do you support clients who feel that using substances help with grief? Yes, and sometimes there are other kind of factors and things that are involved. Um, someone who, who may be grieving where um, may just like add some complexity to that process. So I know that things like, you know, alcohol or different types of drugs and substances are sometimes things that people turn to um, to be able to cope. But again, we just want to be careful that, you know, it's, you know, not having a detriment right to the overall health, to their day to day, um, affecting their ability to connect with other people, but also that it's 
not their only coping strategy, you know, um, and we want to encourage people to connect with more healthy kind of coping strategies. Um, and if someone really is continuously turning to those things um, or unhealthy ways to cope uh, on a regular basis, then we want to think about maybe connecting them to a, a professional who has experience in working with people with substance use disorders or issues or even self-harm and things like that too, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, I see another question. How does one deal with family members who are mean-spirited and impatient with the grief process? Another good one there. Okay, um, it happens, right? We learned that one of the kind of responses um, to grief is sometimes anger, right? And which comes from a place of feeling overwhelmed or out of control or anxious. Um, but sometimes expressing that anger is easier to do than expressing that sadness or that anxiety. So um, I would say if you have someone in your life who is kind of that mean-spirited or impatient with that grief process, to acknowledge and try to accept like within yourself that that's where they are, you know, and that's the journey that they're on. And I'm in a different place and I'm kind of, you know, a, in a different space along that process. And there is only so much that I can do, right? You can't force anyone to catch up to you or to slow down and to be where you are. Um, sometimes we have to try to meet people where they are. We can only provide the support that we're able to provide. Um, and then sometimes we also have to think about setting some boundaries, right? To protect ourselves a little bit. Um, we never, you know, hurting or helping other people shouldn't hurt us in any way. So if we're trying to help support someone who's in that grief process, but they're kind of stuck, you know, in that anger um, <clears throat> or being mean spirited and kind of lashing out, then sometimes we do have to set those boundaries to protect ourselves a little bit. But we can continuously let that person know that I care about you and I want to help. So when you're ready to talk about it or when you're ready to figure out, what that help looks like, then I, I'm happy to have that conversation with you and to help you along that process, right? But and that's a really tricky one, especially when it's like a family member or someone you're really close with, right? Because you want to help them. But sometimes we have to accept that some people are different places and we got to meet them where they are. Great, thank you. I see another question. What is the difference between grief and mourning? That's a good one. I don't know if I've ever really kind of thought about what that difference is or what that means or, you know, because I feel like people can also look at those things differently. To me, at least personally, mourning is allowing that time and space like after a loss to kind of process it a little bit. And grief feels to me at least a more kind of you know, extensive journey or like that kind of lifelong, right? That's something I kind of hold where mourning is like, these are like the kind of rituals that, you know, my family or my culture do traditionally to have that mourning process. Um, so, you know, on a personal level, that's just the kind of difference that I see, but I'm not sure if that's the, that's the real thing or if that's just a me thing. And it might even look different from person to person as well, but that's a good night. I'm going to have to think on that one a little more. Thank you for that. Hey, are there any more questions that you'd like Amanda to answer? I see one. How can people navigate ongoing grief in an environment where they are expected to be okay, such as like work? Yeah, um, I would say try to plan ahead as much as possible. If we've learned anything over the past few years is that work and personal lives are not separate. I know historically we've kept those things very separate, right? I leave work at work, I leave home at home. Um, but then the pandemic happened. We started inviting people into our homes right? and to be able to work. So there was a lot of like blending of that. And I think we're now shifting into a place where we're recognizing that those things we can't always separate. So if you find yourself having a hard time to function or to cope or you know, be in spaces where you're quote unquote expected, right, to be okay or put on that front and to function um, is to plan ahead as much as possible, right? Know what you need to do to feel better, know how to cope, what coping skills you need, um, 
give people a heads up, right, that I'm really struggling right now and I might need some support right in the middle of the workday and find those people who are able to provide that help and provide that support, I think can help kind of manage that. Uh, and have some grace for yourself too. You're a human being. We're all human beings. We have no control over our emotions. We feel things to feel them sometimes, you know. Um, even reviewing this presentation itself, like reading the descriptions of the children's books, like I got a little choked up and I'm like, I'm supposed to be presenting this and like reading these, these descriptions. So, you know, things pop up. Um, but knowing what you need to manage to cope and what you need as far as support, planning ahead for it, looping other people in, knowing that you're not alone in that, um, I think can be, be helpful in that process when you're in those spaces. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, we can go and wrap up. Um, I want to extend a big mahalo to Amanda for being our trainer for today. A few reminders, a couple of you were asking. Um, this training was recorded and will be uploaded on the Public Health Training HUI YouTube channel. You can also find all of our previous training sessions there. To receive continuing education credit for today's webinar, please complete the evaluation form that will be emailed to you by the end of today. The evaluation must be completed by the end of business day, Wednesday, June 19th, 2024. After completing your evaluation, certificates will be emailed to you by the end of business day on Friday, June 28th, 2024. If you have not received your certificate after two weeks following this training, please email myself at melia at hifi.org. It's M-E-L-I-A at H-I-P-H-I dot org and I can help figure that out. Okay, so to sum it up, uh, you will be receiving an email from my, me today with the evaluation link, and if you will please complete the evaluation by Wednesday, then we can get you some continuing education credits. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great weekend.